On today's episode of the 2020 Awards podcast, we're going to be talking with writer, director, and editor John Jeffcoat about his creative process. Actually, I think we can probably throw a cinematographer in there too, right? Sure. Yeah, I added a lot too. Uh, John is the founder of Strange Life Productions, a Seattle-based film and video production company. After years of working on commercials and industrials, John co-wrote a feature film Outsourced with George Wing, which was loosely based on John's travels to Nepal and India. He went on to direct Outsourced, winning numerous awards throughout the country. Outsourced was eventually picked up by NBC and became part of their hit Thursday night comedy lineup. John's currently finishing up post-production on his next feature film, Big in Japan. Welcome back to the show, John. It's great to be here. <laughs> so, um, so over the past few podcasts, we've we've already been talking about some of your your background. But how long how long you've been making movies? Um, when did you get the bug? My freshman year in college. It was, before that, it was really just kind of a dream in the back of my head. And then I did. I, I actually chose. I went to school in the Midwest in in Ohio, in Denison University, about two thousand people. I wanted to go to a small liberal arts and. Um, college and I wanted to make sure there was a cinema major because in the back of my head although I didn't tell anybody I, I had this idea that I could maybe I'd like to do movies and I took the freshman filmmaking 101 class and we were given Canon Scoopic 16 millimeter cameras okay and yeah. we given a couple of roll of film and our first assignment was to film a building and that was it to film a building and make it interesting and so we went out there and I remember very well like coming when I actually and then we they could probably process the film and when when I saw it projected it was the lights just went off like oh my god this is yeah. what I want to do yeah and so from then on I started making short films in college and then uh one of my I remember one of my shorts called Donut Holes was the first one to really play I've seen that on the internet yeah <laughs> it played the Seattle <laughs> Film Festival when I moved here and that was like the you know, I think it might have premiered at the Humboldt University Film Festival or something, which I didn't make it to. But the first time I ever saw it, I think it played it in the university district at the, uh, well, what, what's the one? The the Varsity. Yeah. Oh, but, okay. So yeah. I remember going to see my, my short there. And then from then on, it's about everything I've made is played at the Seattle Film Festival. And um, I, I went from doing a lot of cinematography and uh, work. And, and the, one, the one thing we did in school was we basically... It was such a small department. We made we made films, and we just kind of thrown it like here's the equipment, here's the film, you know, and we had to make it, help each other make films. And so I, I was really hands on from freshman year. I was making films in sixteen millimeter. We were cutting them on flatbed editors, and so when, by the time I graduated, I have a handful of uh, films that I'd shot and directed and edited and written, and. So that was that was great. Although we didn't really come out of it with any professional contacts, you know, it was a small liberal arts school, and right. I didn't really know what to do. Yeah. What do I do now? And then I came to Seattle, and although I'd shot a lot of student films for people, there were so many DPs in town. It was really hard for me to kind of get a foot in the door, and so I kind of defaulted to location sound because oh. there didn't seem to on these little yeah. independent films. Yeah. Well, nobody wants nobody to do wanted sound. to do sound. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It was the one position that was paid, and it's <laughs> right. like I I'd, right. I'd learned how to use a Nagra, you know, audio recorder in college, and so I was like, I can, yeah, I can do that. And yeah. So I started doing it, and I also realized I was, you know. Well, it, what happened? I, I, you do one, and people kind of work with you, and you work out, and so you go to a next next yeah. movie. And next thing I know, you know, a year, a couple years into it, I'm doing like a pretty big feature, and I've got like a mixing board in front of me, and I'm 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 juggling all these wireless mics and a couple booms, and I'm realizing I really don't know. <laughs> what the hell I'm doing. I mean, I do, I can be, you know, this yeah. is, this is getting a little beyond my means. This is yeah. not what I want to be doing. When I talk to other sound guys, they talk about stuff that I don't know what they're talking oh, about. Yeah, and no it's kidding. like, they're, you know, they're the, tech, they're the tech guys. <laughs> and I realize like, this is not, you know, I got, this is, this is it. I got to stop. And so I stopped be doing, doing that. And I started trying to figure out how the hell do you make a feature? And, the one thing I did figure out how to do was write grants and I had an idea for this bingo documentary and so I ended up getting a grant for that and I started writing more and so then all of a sudden I became branded as a documentary filmmaker and so I went on to do little documentary things I did this documentary feature and and that, it, it's, it was just very frustrating for me to because I'd, I'd done more narrative work and I'd been writing and I was CDPing and then I ended up being a sound guy and I was doing documentaries and 
and, and, and I was trying to get back on course and getting a little bit frustrated about the work I was getting or not getting in town. And then that's when I met George and uh, he liked some of the shorts that I'd done and some of the work I'd done and we wanted to work together. And I pitched him the idea for Outsourced and he really loved it. And so we decided to try to write that together. Where would you come up with the idea for that? It was a combination of, I had a lot of stories in my head. My experience as a junior in college, I, I took a semester abroad and I lived in Nepal for like five months and it was an intensive uh, cultural study. And I learned, I used to speak fluent Nepali and it was a really important experience in my life that when I came back to, it was really hard to really, I'd, I'd come back and start talking to my friends, telling my friends about stories about living in this mud hut in the middle of nowhere. And, and after about five minutes, their eyes would glaze over and like, Oh my God, Jeff Cutts telling that Nepal story again. <laughs> you know? right. And it's like, so there was just a disconnect and I can, I just, it was a, there was so much that I experienced that I just couldn't share or, you know, that people just didn't quite grasp. Yeah. And, um, well, we should, so the story for outsourced is, is what? Go ahead and tell us. Well, it's it's about a guy from Seattle who works in a customer relations. Basically, he basically sells these novelty items over the phone. And when his business gets outsourced, he's sent to India to train his replacements. And this is a guy who's really never left his city. He's not, he's not had any international experience. And so all of a sudden, he's thrown into this very different world. Right. And so it was a great opportunity for me to to share a lot of the experience that I had living and traveling in Nepal, and then also in India. Because I'd also then gone to India, spent some time in India working on a documentary on the Indian film industry. While I was working on that documentary and interviewing these independent filmmakers and things, it occurred to me like, wow, this is a really great place to make a film where we could probably, you could do it on the cheap. And it's yeah. like, there's, the industry is huge and there's so much. And that's all of a sudden the wheel started turning. I should, what kind of movie could I make? in India. And then it was a combination of also just always listening to NPR and KUOW in the morning and hearing about, <laughs> yeah. you know, this has been outsourced and this has been outsourced and, you know, Boeing sends their employees here or Microsoft's done this. And so at some point I'm having breakfast and this idea about the guy from Seattle who has to go train his replacement comes to my head and merges these two ideas. And I immediately call George up and I say, what do you think about the guy, you know, this idea of a guy who loses his job and has to go train his replacement in India? And it was kind of silence. I was just thinking, okay, well, another dud. Cause I, we've been pitching yeah, each other lots yeah, of yeah, projects yeah. that just yeah. didn't, didn't stick. And we were trying to find that one that stuck. And George had spent a lot of time traveling in Central America. And, and he, it turns out he had a lot of the similar experiences that I had, but in a totally different country. But anyway, it was this silence on the other, under the line. And then, um, He's like, it, someone's, someone's got to have done it. It's got to, someone's doing it. It must be done. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't, I haven't seen anything. I don't know. And so he, he, we immediately started looking, researching and see if anyone has done anything like this about outsourcing and quickly found there was nothing. And so I went over to, to his house and he basically said, tell me everything you know. And so I went through and told him everything I knew about what I wanted to do and the characters and all this. And so we laid it out on this kitchen table basically. And then, um, he started just grilling me about different things and we we laid out almost you know this raw structure of the whole film right there in that one night and it's pretty good and it was pretty and, and we were just we knew we had something because it came out so easily right. and then we yeah. had so many, every time i told him a story about what happened to me he had something that was so similar and it was just so great to be able to build off each other's things but and then it became the complicated part task of okay working out all the relationships and all the intricacies and that took a long time and we did not write anything at all until our outline was completely, you know, finished. Yeah. And it was a wonderful process and it was just great, you know, working off each other. And even making the film was a tremendous, we know, finding Shadowcatcher to produce it was a dream come true. Um, how, how was it going over to India as far as, was it kind of a turnkey operation? Did you guys kind of just walk in and everything was in place or no. was it more like you had to set everything there was, up from scratch. <laughs> there was two, well, we did find that there was two separate trips that went, that we were, we went over one to location scout and also to find a production company to, to work with. We didn't know if we were going to shoot in Chennai and Mumbai, you know, where in the country we were going to shoot. So we, we, we traveled and we checked out a few places, but it quickly became apparent that Mumbai was probably going to be the best place where we could find English speaking crews and, and work in a style that the producers felt comfortable working in and that where we had good access to talent. Um, and uh, once we figured that out, 
then we put together this amazing team. And I, I mean, the, the technicians were, were really fantastic. And it was kind of outrageous because I mean, I'd come from working on pretty small crews and all of a sudden I was, I'm on set with, you know, the crew would come out of the woodwork because we had like our main key guys who spoke English, but then they had their minions who, and every little piece of equipment came with another guy. <laughs> and so we'd go from having what seemed like a small crew to all of a sudden there'd be like over a hundred people like on set moving right. all this kind yeah. of stuff around. And it was like, whoa, it was just well, uh, yeah, huge. I've heard, I've heard that like in India that basically sandbags are human beings. So if you need to set up a light, it's not a sandbag that... Well, each light keeps it in yeah. place. It's a person who stands and holds it, right? Or that that is true to a certain degree. But like yeah. every light, yeah, will have his own guy looking after it, and That's it won't crazy. be like a couple of guys moving this light and then moving that light. It's yeah. like, and it enabled them to move so fast. I mean, I was kind of used to like you know okay we got to move the dolly track over here no we don't have time cut it we got to lose that dolly yeah. and here it's like i'd be thinking like well it'd be great to have this this dolly here but the, the crane's already it's on the dolly on the other side of the building we'll never and i look over and it's like they're already set laying the track yeah. and the train's already disassembled and they're putting it together i mean it's just that the, they were so efficient wow it was tremendous it was Did each wedge for the track <laughs> come with a handler <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> Not but it's bad. like there was times where i'm thinking i couldn't tell if we had gawkers or if it was our crew that was hanging around like That's i just crazy. had no idea I and you tell. probably did it for nothing right I mean, financially yeah but we did it for very little i mean we did it for a lot more than we probably could have done it for it just for, we paid more to work with a production service company that at least we we talked to several different people but we wanted someone who's where the books were going to be as transparent as possible yeah and which is not an easy thing to do and it because a lot of times people just say oh yeah no problem no problem you know and you have to, have to take the word and it was right. that was really right. tough for our producers who are trying to track the money and so we definitely paid more to work with these people, but it, it definitely, I think, took a lot of the worry out of it. Yeah. The thing that was surprising was the hotel costs and stuff was crazy. It was expensive. Oh, really? Because we, we stayed in nice hotels, for sure, but to just make sure no one got sick, although people still were getting yeah. sick. Yeah, yeah. And now it's really expensive in Mumbai. I mean, it's amazing how the economy oh. has been growing and... Uh, that was another thing that, sh that struck well, me. Well, our, our jobs have been outsourced. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. It's amazing. Um, what about how many how many crew did you bring over here or over there from? from there was the, about nine of us. Okay, was, there was who like did you bring? Nine. It was just me, our two producers, David Skinner and Tom Gorai, our cinematographer Teo Maniachi, who was out of New York, um, Gwen Bialik, who was our line producer, also out of New York, and then had. Uh, an assistant camera operator, we ended up flying out because we couldn't find a reliable focus puller over there for whatever reason. Oh. We, we tried to get recommendations and no one. Huh. So we had to bring Amy over to, to oh, and then we had a script supervisor. Yeah. Because they were, weren't really too concerned about continuity in India. Right. In right. Indian films. So. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah. So there was a small. Is that something that, like, too. once you got there, you realized... Oh, and oh. our sound, sorry, our sound department too, because so much of the movie, so many of the movies there, there was only like one or two sound teams in like the whole country that did actual production, like location audio. Production. Is most of it ADR'd? Yeah, it's all, it's all they just, so it's, it's all like, like scratch track stuff. Spaghetti and they Westerns. just everything yeah. afterward in yeah. post. Yeah. So we ended up bringing over this great team, a husband and wife team that from the States that did a great job because that was just a worry that the guys that we've got over there might. Right, thinking it's a scratch track or something. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And, and so the continuity, was that something once you got over there you realized? No, we knew that the script supervisor, after talking to our production service company, there weren't that many people who were going to work in the style that we wanted. Yeah. We tried to work with as many. We, I wanted an American. I mean, there's some great cinematographers over there, but I wanted an American eye in the foreign land yeah. uh, from the, for this, yeah. this, this movie. So that's the only reason we didn't go with an Indian cinematographer, because they are amazing over there. And so everyone that we could source from there, we sourced from there. We got all right. of our gear from there. Yeah. We didn't bring any gear. We got cameras. The cameras may have came from Germany, but I think they might have been, or a combination of Germany and, and India. And our, we got the film process there. And it was great working over there. There's some really wonderful people and uh, facilities. What would you shoot on? We shot on 35 millimeter oh, Airflex. Did. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, if anybody wants to see John's yeah. movie, you can find it at Scarecrow Video. <laughs> Scarecrow Video is one of the largest independent video stores in the country, located in Seattle's beautiful University District. One of the last remaining brick-and-mortar stores featuring DVDs, VHS, Laserdisc, and Blu-ray. Is your movie on uh, Laserdisc? I have no... I don't think so. I think Laserdiscs had stopped. I think... Didn't they put out a collector's edition of Outsourced? 
on Laserdisc? On Laser, I don't know. If they just did, I want yes. it. Just say yes. Yeah, probably. You have to go to Scarecrow and, and see. If you can't find a movie at Scarecrow, <laughs> it hasn't been filmed yet. For more info, visit scarecrowvideo.com. And while you're watching John's movie, enjoy a Hilliard's beer. Brewed and canned in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, but drunk everywhere. Visit their tap room Thursday through Sunday. You can get more info on them at hilliardsbeer.com. So, we had another podcast where you were on where we we talked about Wings of Desire being sort of a film that kind of influenced you. What what are some of the other influences that kind of excited you? You said you saw that movie in high school, but you didn't get into filmmaking or know you want to be a filmmaker until college. So I guess that and like what excites you when you see a movie? Well, I I think we were talking before. I I definitely am drawn to good cinematography and striking cinematography. Another person who's gotten really popular now is Terrence Malick. But back when I saw Badlands or, you know, for the first time or Days of Heaven, he wasn't very well known. And and, uh, and, but there were movies that really resonated. And now I have to say he's putting them out more frequently than I can watch them and I'm, or maybe and I've it's kind of weird because he was like he would he, he kind of made one movie like every 10 years yeah. or something like that and now it seems like every other year he's got well it's like I mean I just got to the wonder is, is sitting on the table in our kitchen and I haven't watched it yet my wife put it in and she's and I said oh how was the movie and she's like if, you know I turn it off if I saw one more woman dragging her hand through some kind of silky cloth I'm going to throw up <laughs> <You know? laughs> I thought she was going to say through corn or yeah, wheat yeah. or something well, that's like the that thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah. and so I, it wasn't exactly a stellar review it got me excited <laughs> to do it but yeah I mean his stuff I, I think he's definitely found this sort of style that he likes to do and he, he is uh, his, his stuff is starting to feel repetitive a little bit now but it was pretty fresh when I was watching it there and then uh, you know I think like you in high school I went through you know although I, I'm a huge John Hughes fan and I love you know, uh-huh. 16 Candles yeah. one of my favorites and you know and they're is just it? great oh yeah oh, that's I, awesome and, and, yeah. Uh, but then I also that was sort of the sort of the PG rated thing, and then I got really into Ken Russell and Rogue. You were talking yeah, about. Nicholas Rogue, yeah. and I think one of the yeah, I just made a film called Big in Japan, and it's a rock and roll road movie, and it's like featuring a real band, tennis pro, but you know, playing fictionalized characters of themselves. And yeah. Part of it, I really loved movies with like Mick Jagger and David Bowie and Art Garfunkel, and there was something that was really raw and kind of fun and, yeah. and different than Sixteen Candles and this other sure. stuff. And so I was really drawn to this stuff that just felt, you know, the man who fell to earth, and you know, there was a little bit more raw, a little more weird, and it was exciting. Yeah. And then I started watching Altered States and Gothic and Lair of the White Worm. And some of those got <laughs> yeah. really bizarre. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was really drawn to it and that was kind of exciting. And I mean, I don't think you're going to see any of that influence in outsourced. <laughs> but, well, I was uh, going to say, I mean, it's, it, those are all, yeah. those are very different sort of influences than really, I think I've only seen outsourced of your work. But. Yeah. I mean, Big in Japan is definitely different and I have sort of, done a lot of most of my work seems to be in the comedy realm although I definitely would love to do a thriller I think there's so few good thrillers out there yeah. and that's something that you know I was I was a big Hitchcock fan as well and I, 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 I'm a fan of um, the brothers uh Coen Brothers? The Coen Brothers, yeah. of course. You know, I was, uh, although they have become a bit hit and miss. I mean, I still, I think their very first film, Blood Simple, I just thought was so great. I, yeah. I always loved Blood Simple. And yeah, that's one of my favorites. Just, uh, I don't feel like they've maybe hit that. I mean, I wish, I wish they'd kind of do something in that vein again. But, uh, you know, I, I loved their style. They have a great style. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the content doesn't keep up with the style i feel like yeah and uh, I, I always I, you know, I always feel like they're the greatest student filmmakers of all yeah time. They like they, like if you were to just watch like because you know eventually afi is going to give them you know the like whatever their yeah. prestigious honor thing that they do yeah i think if you just watch that yeah. and see all the clips you just go like these guys must be the greatest filmmakers ever and then there's stuff almost like i it's never cohesive to yeah. me. Well, I think I think like Miller's Crossing trailer was like one of the best trailers I think I've sure. ever seen in my life. Yeah. It was unbelievable. But then you watch the movie, and some parts of it. I mean, the scene when they go to kill that guy and you oh, know, uh, Albert was, Finney. Yeah, yeah, it's that, fantastic, unbelievable. It's amazing. But the movie yeah. is so yeah. weird. You yeah. know, there's so much weirdness going on. It didn't necessarily. I, I that's another one I probably should go back and watch. And I remember really enjoying. It took me about eight viewings to finally figure out what was going on. Yeah, yeah. 
trying to give me the high hat. Is that what he says? Or I can't remember. The high hat. He's giving me the high hat. And then also, what's the crit with John Goodman running down the hallway? Was oh, the, Martin Fink. Martin Fink, another yeah. one that I, I yeah. really liked when it came out. And then I tried to watch it recently. And there's some good stuff in it. But, I, you know, again, it, visually, it's just so stunning. And yeah. they, they yeah. know what they're doing, but sometimes I just don't feel like the content totally right. backs up their style. Well, you know, so that raises an interesting point. You write, yeah. you direct, you edit. What are some of the pros and cons? What do you like? What's your preference? Writing is the most difficult, I think. Yeah. That's why I really liked working with George. He helped me. I, I get stuck with the possibilities. There's so many possibilities right. around yeah. every corner, yeah. and it just makes it impossible for me to be decisive. I, when I'm on the set and I'm directing, I can be very decisive. And it's so, it was probably the most important thing a director, aside from getting along with everyone and creating that really positive mood I, on set, it also is just being decisive. An indecisive director is going to cost everyone money, and it's just going to reflect poorly on the film. But but it's harder to. It's I also going to make it harder to cut. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's just shoot it from every angle and then right. we'll just figure it out in the edit. Right, yeah, right. That's, that, I don't do that. I find like the writing can be very rewarding, but it's really tough and I'm really not hard enough on myself. I find cinematography to be easier, but I also, I've never really. I haven't worked a lot as a cinematographer because I don't like shooting other people's films necessarily. Yeah. It's a very personal thing, I guess. And so I, I really, one thing that I've learned as I've gotten older and done more work is the one thing that's going to set me aside from all, so many other people who are doing this is my gut instincts. And it's like really learning to trust your gut, trust mm -hmm. your instincts. And the more you can kind of let go and follow that, the more it's going to separate you from what everybody else is doing. And right. I don't know, for whatever reason the cinematography is, is something that I don't like to try to explain because so much of it is like, you know, you find it. And yeah, I've always shot my own stuff. I've shot a few other people's things, but I haven't enjoyed that process as much. Whereas I, you give me anything and I'll edit it. Editing yeah. is something where I've earned a lot of my, I keep editing because yeah. I'll edit, any, I'll edit yeah. just about anything because it's always a nice challenge to try to put that piece together. And you're not as emotionally engaged as if you're shooting it or you're directing it. So editing has you, been- And you cut your own stuff, right? Yes and no. I've learned to step away from it to a certain degree, but yeah. even when we bring on, like, outsource, we had another editor, but still I was involved. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so I've been an editor on everything. I've never not edited, but I've walked away from being the lead editor. Yeah. But that's, I, that's what I learned on, on when I did the feature. Yeah. It's like, oh, somebody else should do this. Yeah. You know, and I, if only for no other reason, just to have the perspective. Yeah. So when you walk in and you watch something, you yeah. go like, oh, this works or this doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to do that too. And it's not like with Big in Japan, especially I needed to bring, uh, Big in Japan was scripted, but also we had a lot of improvisation. So there's a lot of material that I was pretty close to and we brought in Michelle Witten to, to put together a cut. She started mining all the stuff that I'd kind of written off as kind of us goofing around or stuff that I just felt like maybe, you know, I just never considered would fit in the movie yeah. and saw it fresh and thought, oh my God, this is funny. We should put this in here and right, this would right. work here. And, yeah. and it was so great to have those fresh eyes because I never would have done that. See, that's, the, yeah, that's yeah. the other thing I learned was generally now I have other people cut my work Yeah, and it's, it's almost that moment where it's like, oh, that's not supposed to go there, but oh, oh wait, that actually works where you put it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. okay, good. This, and it's really exciting to see yeah. somebody take your concepts and just mess with them enough, but make yeah. them work maybe better yeah. than what you had expected. And well, Outsource was so, the script was so tight and it, the budget was so limited to what we the way we were doing it was you know we had no res reshoots we shot everything and if we didn't get it it wasn't the movie yeah and we because we were leaving the country and we were there was no <laughs> reshoots yeah. so it was incredibly efficient and so when i was shooting i knew it was pretty obvious how everything was going to go together yeah so that was i almost kind of knew a shorthand which enabled me to assemble stuff and then it was like helping break when someone else could come in and kind of fine tune it and tweak right. it right that was great but with like big in japan we shot so much we had a lot of scenes that ended up being cut we had a lot of stuff that was improv that didn't work and some stuff that we i thought didn't work did work and all this live performance stuff and i think so for documentary in particular too it's like you have a sense of what you're getting, what you, and especially you have a sense of what you wanted to get. And there's a big difference to what you think you got and what you really got. Yeah. And so it's yeah. great to have that second pair of eyes to be like, I see where you're going with that, John, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not what is there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like to have someone who can tell you that yeah. and then figure out other ways to get to your point B yeah. is really fantastic. Yeah. So, so big in Japan, that George was talking a little bit about that when he was on the show. You guys, was that pretty much you 
were your crew or did you have talk well, about that a little bit i'll back up a little bit there's a project i did which which is part of the five dollar cover thing that happened in seattle oh yeah, yeah. tv and I, lynn shelton had asked me to shoot documentaries about all the different bands that were featured in the show right so i shot 13 short documentaries and i said i'd do it if i could I, there was a new camera at the time called the Canon 5D Mark II, which <laughs> of course changed everything. Um, and at the time, the there camera were, that now we all laugh at. Yeah, you know, so, I, mean, I still I still praise it. I, I, I love it, but, but it's, uh, it's funny how everybody's sort of like, Ooh, yeah, yeah, that? which which brought shallow depth of focus to the indie scene. Yeah, um, I I wanted I was really interested in just having creative freedom and shooting getting because I I'd, I'd kind of left cinematography for a while in the whole when the the canon f900 came out there, there was just too many formats there was too yeah. many different cameras there was mini d the dv then there was dv cam then there was dvc pro then there was avhcd there was all this crap and i just got sick of keeping up with it i was still shooting film you know I, my, on my stills camera i i, I, I shoot a lot of stills too and i just kind of gave up on cinematography for a while i just let it go and it wasn't until the 5d came out and i started seeing what people were doing with it and i it was to me ivc right our local film processing place here went out of business and that to me was the death knell of right okay i'm not gonna really get my slides processed anymore yeah. i'm gonna have to look at getting a digital camera and 5d mark ii could do my stills and i could maybe shoot right. film very video yeah and so that was my jumping back into cinematography and with these 13 episodes of the amplified docs that i did and it was essentially me by myself with an audio recorder and the camera doing interviews and shooting b-roll to do these things and as i went along i actually met a drummer for a band called the maldives um ryan mcmackin who i saw also at a 5d and he it turns out he was a cinematographer and got him to come on and help be my second camera every once in a while and then eventually um met a sound guy named adam powers who came on and did some audio for me but essentially it was me solo doing these little documentaries and then at the highest height of it, like we had three of us together, a mm -hmm. three person crew. And I was kind of blown away at the quality we got with available light yeah. using these little cameras yeah. and just having our gear in our backpack. And I thought this would be really interesting to take this style and this technique and bring it to a feature film and that's and then at that point we had a, one of the producers of mtv the five dollar cover had come to me and said there's this band tennis pro and they have this idea about going to japan and and kind of introduced us and we and we thought about it and i thought this, this could be a really great project to try to take the you know the th what about a trio shooting a trio uh -huh. and like how small can we make our crew and without really uh, taking a hit to the production value yeah. i didn't want it to make it look like crap it should be you know let's get on the road let's bring these cameras where we can't right. really go yeah. and yeah. try to get production value out of that location of being in tokyo yeah so we put together a kickstarter and raised like 13 grand and got some miles donated and we next thing we know we were like the six of us plus one other actor who was also our sort of tour guy uh, we went to Tokyo for and, and started shooting and we didn't know each other that well and the guys hadn't acted much before and it, right. it was a lot of liquid courage on yeah, their part, yeah, you know, so yeah. it became like this crazy sort of party scene, like they were doing like nine shows in like 12 days or something yeah. and we were all on foot and all of our gears in our backpacks. And so... Uh, it was it was really wild. And it was again. It was just me, another camera guy, and a sound guy. We had no script supervisor. Right. We had no. A lot of it was improv. We had a really rough outline of what we right. wanted to do, and we came back and I assembled the footage and it just kind of showed it to some people and people were like, wow, this is really cool. I want to see this movie. And we're like, yeah. Wow. It's like we didn't really know what we had or what we went, and we realized we got some really great stuff, but we don't have the movie. So that's when I realized I had to write a script and. Um, and go back and try to do the dramatic section of it. Oh. So if we, it was two trips to Tokyo and we ended up pulling some investors together, which was interesting because we had no script, we had no actors. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do we raise money for this? Right. Um, but a lot of it was based on these things I had done for MTV and then of course outsourced and this ended up keeping the budget really low. So it was a bit, and I also have another project with George that we're talking about doing, which is, sort of a backpacking adventure movie. Yeah, he'd mentioned um, that. Which he's which we're in development on. And um, this was sort of a trial run to see, again, how small a crew it's comfortable to work with yeah. without sacrificing and so, so what do you think? Is it something you would do again? 
Not exactly the way we did that. Yeah. I was, it was incredibly taxing on us and yeah. I did feel like I was, it's, so you're always going to be making some sacrifices, right. but I felt like I was yeah. making more sacrifices than I really wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I still watch them. I, you know, I watched the movie now. We had a screening recently and I'm kind of blown away at what we yeah. were able to do. Um, cause I think it looks better than so many of the little indies that are out there. Yeah. So I'm really proud of that. But I also felt, I think back and realized, you know, where we could have brought it with just a couple more people right. or with an eight, if we had an AD or if we had yeah. a couple of production assistants. So it was a, it was a really great experience and I'm really proud of what we did. And it's really, I'm really curious to see how people respond to it, but it's, it's also, it was a very specific kind of movie and it was meant to be, it's a, it was a, it's a fun rock and roll road movie. And so it there was a, people can expect to have there's there's like there's some tangents we go on and then we there's right. it's definitely a, a movie you curl up with a couple beers with and some friends right, and right, watch right. it and yeah. whereas if i was doing anything that was more of a fine-tuned thriller or something i definitely would probably want more right but it was a great experience to like you know what what to how small you can go and yeah. you can go pretty small these days and that's pretty that's impressive i mean yeah. to say you've shot a feature with three. basically three people <laughs> yeah. you know that's pretty good yeah that's good. we talk about the, just the concept of but the, the whole 2020 award thing is a really, there's a couple things that came to mind when I start looking back to what happened 20 years ago. First of all, I'm kind of shocked at how long ago, like it makes me feel old for yeah, one. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just like, wow, we've come a long way in some ways, but yet you know in some ways it's like we've taken so many steps backwards. Well, thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure, Chris. I'd love to come back sometime. <laughs> uh, seriously, <laughs> thanks for joining us today, John. Uh, and people can follow your exploits on Twitter at... At Jeff Coat, J-E-F-F-C-O-A-T. So uh, there you go. If you want to right. follow uh, Big in Japan, see where it's going to be screening in a town near you, uh, you can follow John at Jeff Coat on Twitter. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Honest Tea and Scarecrow Video. And until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past.